Welcome back. The topic this time is going to be studying matchings and graphs. So if you remember, there's two ways to think about a matching. You can either think of it as a collection of disjoint edges in a graph, or you can think of it as a one regular subgraph. That is a, a subgraph, all of which all of whose vertices have degree one. So you're just um, uh, singling out a bunch of little dumbbells inside the graph that don't touch each other. So um, a matching is called maximal if um, it has as many edges as possible. And it's called perfect if it contains every vertex. So that is, if there's an edge in your matching that's incident to every vertex. Um, alternately, from the point of view of subgraphs, you would say that a matching is perfect if um, it's a spanning one regular subgraph. Now, in most applications of matching, um, the underlying graphs under consideration are going to be bipartite. This makes sense in terms of, like, say, a scheduling problem or something like that, or an assignment problem, I guess you would call it, where you have a group of people and a group of tasks. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, here's an example of an assignment task. So we have here a number of different tasks, an assignment problem, a number of different tasks, and a number of different people on this side. The edges represent compatibility, so this task can be done by either this person or this person or that person. And the question is, is it possible to choose for each task one of the people in such a way that all the tasks are able to get done and no person has to do more than, uh, is assigned to do more than one task? Let's see, am I going to get lucky? Um, no, I'm already out of luck. So this person can't do this and can't do that. So the question is, if I choose, if I choose things correctly, is it um, possible to solve this kind of an assignment problem? Let's begin by remembering a few important tools that are going to help us understand maximum um, matchings and uh, things like that. So if we have a matching, um, then there is a notion of a vertex being saturated or not. So remember, a vertex is called saturated if it's incident to one of the edges in the marking, in, in the matching. Um, and if P is a path, then we say the path is called alternating, or M alternating, I should say. If the edges um, are alternately in and not in M. Right, so an M alternating path would look something like this. We have this, this, this this, this, where let's say this color means um, not in M, and this color would mean in M. So if you have a path whose edges alternate between not being in M and being in M, this is called an M alternating path. And it's called um, M augmenting if the ends are M unsaturated. So um, uh, in this path over here, these last edges are not in M, and if no other edges of M are incident to this edge, I mean, this is just some path inside of a larger graph, right? We might have other edges that I haven't drawn. And if this uh, vertex is not incident to um, any other edge, which is in M, we know it's not incident to those two, but there might be others, and if it's not, then it's called and if that holds on both sides, this path is called M unsaturated. Sorry, M um, augmenting, excuse me. And um, so the main lemma that we, that we proved before is that um, M is maximum if and only if there exist no M augmenting paths. And that is the fundamental notion that's going to, uh, the fundamental uh, tool that we're going to use. Here's what we're going to show. Suppose G is a bipartite graph with bipartition X, Y. So just with two parts, X and Y. If G has no matching that saturates every vertex of X, then there exists some subset of vertices such that the set of vertices which are adjacent to those vertices uh, excuse me, some vertices in our, in our set X, such that the set of vertices adjacent to that 
has fewer things than S itself does. So this is probably easier to think about um, kind of via the, uh, the contrapositive, which I'll write as a corollary, and that is if for all subsets the number of things incident to the vertices in that subset are at least as big as the number of things in that subset, then there exists a matching which saturates every vertex in X. And this is a nice kind of a criteria. It gives us some way um, in which in certain situations we can be guaranteed to be able to solve this scheduling problem. So if X are the tasks, then, we, then as long as for each collection of tasks, the number of people who can do that task, those tasks, is at least equal to those number of tasks. You know, so if I pick these five tasks, are there at least five people that can do those five tasks? If that's true for every subset of those tasks, then in fact the scheduling problem, or the assignment problem, has a solution. Okay, so um, in fact the converse of this is actually even, even uh, simpler, right? I could say that this is actually um, an if and only if, right? Because if there is a matching um, which saturates everything in X, then for every subset of things in X, I can look at the corresponding things that they're matched to. Those are things in the neighborhood, and there's at least as many things as there are in the set. So this is actually an if and only if. Um, and I guess I could say, so this is an if and only if. But the interesting part is going to be just the direction that I originally wrote. That's the interesting direction. All right, so let's go ahead and prove that. Um, so we're going to start by considering M star a maximum matching. And we're going to suppose that um, that maximum matching misses some vertex in X. So at least there's some little X in X which is unsaturated. And what we would like to do is construct a subset of vertices of X such that the things which are adjacent to those vertices, the neighborhood of that subset, has fewer things in it than the original subset. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to consider um, all the alternating paths. starting um, with x. So imagine it's something like this. Here we start at x. Of course, x is something in capital X. And this being a bipartite graph, we have to hop you know, on our paths from x um, to y to x to y, etc. Because x is unsaturated, this edge is not an M. And because it's an alternating path, the, um, the, those other edges um, have to be in M. So that is to say, all the edges in our alternating paths, which go from y to x, are in M, and all the ones that go from x to y are not in M. So we're going to let S be the vertices uh, in x in these paths, and T are going to be the vertices in y in these paths. Okay? So if I start at x, I'm just going to look at all the alternating paths, and the vertices that I can get to on my first landing, or on my third landing, or on my fifth landing um, in y, are the things that I'm going to call t, and the ones um, on the even landings are going to be the ones in s. And of course that includes um, x as well, being a length zero alternating path. Okay, well let's make some observations about these two sets, s and t. The first observation that I'd like to make is that every vertex in T is, is um, going to be matched by an M star to some vertex in S. So what are the vertices in T? They're obtained by starting at X and doing some sort of a walk, uh, which is an alternating walk. So going this way, this is uh, unsaturated, so I have to stay out of M going on my first hop. And then the subsequent one is an M, the next one is not an M, and then back up here to x. Um, and if I end in, um, in y, this is a typical vertex, let's say, little y and y and t, right, t being the things obtainable by an alternating walk, then, well, first observation is that um, y can't be unsaturated. It has to be saturated. 
because if it was unsaturated, like um, if there was no more green edges touching the Y, then X and Y would both be unsaturated and we would have an augmenting walk. And that would contradict, that would be a contradiction. So, um, contradict the maximality, um, uh, the, ma the maximumness of M. Okay, so X and Y are both saturated, but that means that after I uh, end up over here, there has to be at least one other um, edge in the matching to continue with. This edge is going to be some new one, not hitting any of the previous vertices, because the previous vertices in this walk were all, um, were all matched to things inside of T. And, um, and because the matching has disjoint edges, this has to be something new, right? Okay, so that says that, um, that everything in T is actually matched to something in S. But conversely, if I start at S, and in fact if I look at S, let's say not without X actually, so uh, excluding the vertex X, which is, um, you know, has an alternating path from X to X because just the zero path is, is such a path, the empty path. But, um, but, but everything in S, not including X, is actually matched to something in T. Well, why is that? Well, if, you, um, if you're in S but not in, but not X, then you have some alternating walk starting at X, where you go boom, 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 and eventually you land back, you know, at your, at your vertex in S but not X. But in that walk, the thing right before you got there was something inside of T. And therefore, there, uh, because it's alternating, it was connected to that thing in T by an edge that was in M, because it's an alternating walk, and therefore you are um, matched to something in T. Now, if you take these two parts together, what that tells you is that um, the vertices in T um, are in correspondence via M to vertices in S, and conversely, the vertices in S, with the exception of X, are matched to things in T. Uh, if you think about that, what that tells you is that there is a bijection uh, induced by these edges of, of M star. There's a bijection between um, S minus X, this is in bijection, with the things inside of T. So consequently, what you have is that the number of things in T is the same as the number of things in S minus 1. Now, to finish this off, we're actually going to show that T is the neighborhood of S. So, Klein, T is the neighborhood of S, which would, um, which would then contradict my, um, or which would then give the desired conclusion, right? I wanted to find some subset whose neighborhood is smaller than itself, and T, uh, sorry, S is a subset whose neighborhood T is going to be smaller than itself, okay? So this will uh, finish the job. Well, part of this is straightforward. Certainly, if you have something inside of T, you're obtaining it by walking along, starting from X, and eventually getting to your guy, or right? so you start with X, and you go boom, 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 boom. Eventually, you get to any particular guy um, inside of T. So here's my little Y inside of T. So if y is inside of t, well, that implies that if you follow this walk along, the thing right before y was something in s. And so everything in t is adjacent to something in, f, in, in s, right? So this y is in t implies y is actually in the neighborhood of s. Now, the, the tricky part is the converse. So now, for the converse, we're going to assume that we have a y which is in the neighborhood of s. So it's adjacent to some vertex, this like this one, which is obtainable by starting from x and doing some sort of an alternating walk. Uh, excuse me, an alternating path. And what we would like to show is that if we're adjacent to some vertex um, uh, obtained by an alternating path landing in x, then actually there is an alternating path all the way from x to y. Okay, so we're going to argue by contradiction just because I think it's slightly easier to think about. So um, if not, if y is not in t, well, then, well, we know that we are adjacent. Y is adjacent to some, let's say, V. Maybe this is our V over here. And there's two possibilities. It's either adjacent via some edge of the matching, or it's adjacent via some edge not in the matching. Well, if, 
if v is you can walk if you can uh, do an alternating path to v and y is adjacent to v via an edge that's in the matching well it's a matching so there's only one edge in the matching that could be um, that could be incident to v and that would imply that y actually is part of that alternating path okay so it therefore follows that if y is adjacent to v then it's adjacent via an edge not in this matching okay but now here's the trouble. If we can get to V um, via an alternating path, and then if Y is adjacent to V via an edge not in the matching, well, then this is actually an alternating path to Y. It's an alternating path to Y. Well, why is it an alternating path to Y? Because, well, the only thing that could go wrong is if this is if Y I had hit it already before. Because this is, in other words, if the path was not a path, if it was just some sort of a walk, if I had joined this thing. But if if it was just a walk, then that means y would have had to come earlier, which would have meant that there was still an alternating path to y, which would have meant y is in t in any case. So therefore, we've actually shown that t is the neighborhood of s. What we proved before is that the number of things in t is one fewer than the number of things in s. And um, so this is the neighborhood of s. And that implies that the number of things in the neighborhood is actually less than the number of things in the set as we were originally trying to prove, and that finishes the proof.